Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Dominic Dyer from Care for Wild. very important all the great things they do but I'm really really honored to be here you, know, you as a charity have done amazing work to protect badgers up and down this country we're meeting at a very difficult time with this cull going on at the present time but let's not forget what you've achieved with your legal moves with your campaigning with your lobbying with working with other organizations like care for the wild and the RSPCA day in day out year in year out through volunteers through hard work on the ground working with politicians working with the media you've done a great job You've really made people think about badgers in a way that we haven't done before. You've made people think about protecting wildlife in a way that we haven't done before. And I'm extremely proud to be with you here today. But I want to really sort of start, I suppose, by giving you a bit of background about me, why here and why now. Um, a lot of people say to me when you talk about the badger cub, you suddenly get sort of pigeonholed immediately. You're either pro-farmer and pro cub, or you're anti-farmer and anti cub and you can't be anything in between. And I'm not pro-farmer anti cull or the other way around, I'm confusing myself to start with, but what my background is, is, is very much based on farming and agriculture that goes back an awful long way. You know, I started at 16 years of age in the Ministry of Agriculture, working in animal welfare, working in criminal prosecutions for farmers who were not protecting their animals or looking after them as they should. I worked through from that age on into trade policy and, and agricultural issues both in the UK and in Brussels, in organic farming, in milk and dairy sectors of our farming economy. And, and learned an awful lot about how government worked and about how farming and agriculture worked. I then left to, to join the Food and Drink Federation, which is the voice of the food and drink industry, and worked at a high level with all the major food manufacturers in Unilever, Nestle, and other companies that you're familiar with, again, working with government on a UK and international basis on a wide range of areas, and dealing with problems such as foot and mouth and other issues that broke out in the food chain and had an impact across everything that those businesses did. Before I started doing the work I've done over the last 12 months in Care for the Wild, I was Chief Executive of the Crop Protection Association, and again, working at a very senior level in plant science and agriculture with the leaders of the National Farmers Union, with people like Jim Pace, with Hilary Benn and others in, in, in the Labour government prior, prior to this coalition. Very much part of the agricultural establishment, part of the, the scene, as it were, of people that would come together to develop policy, to look at what was happening in the economy, how we protect the interests of farming and landowners and food producers. But also I was chairman of Care for the Wild for all that period of time as well. A committed conservationist, someone who believes strongly in wildlife protection, not just on the UK, but on an international basis as well. And it's that issue that really drove me to where I am today, because as I saw this policy emerge, as I could see the weaknesses in this policy, I became increasingly angry about what we are facing today. There is no scientific, economic, or animal welfare justification for the badger call. Let's be clear about that. This is the worst farm and environment policy that I've seen in 30 years of working in government, industry, and agriculture. There's nothing quite like it. It's got more holes than a Swiss cheese. It should never have got off the starting board. It's a politically driven policy. It's not a science driven policy. And it's doing great harm not only to our wildlife, but to the reputation of farmers in this country as well. And I think you've really got to look back and see how this all started. It was interesting a few weeks ago that Crystal Donnelly, one of the main architects, to a degree of this policy and work very closely on the randomized badger cull trial was speaking about the whole issue of TB management. One of the key issues for me that came out of that particular presentation was a clear recognition from her and other leading scientists that TB in badgers has come from cattle. Let's just start from that process. It didn't come from outer space, it came from cattle. And it came about from the early 1970s onwards. The first documented case I think was in 1971. And it came about because of the intensification of our livestock and dairy industries. And that is an industrial farm pollution issue. Okay, Farmers have polluted our wildlife. You have to start from that point. And when you start from that point, then you can have a proper debate. It's not a debate for a farmer to say, well, listen, I have a problem. But you created the problem. In any other form of industrial or farm pollution that I've dealt with over the years, for example, pesticide issues, if there is a problem with a particular pesticide, it can be removed. In the case of DDT, it was removed because of the impact it was having on birds of prey. We've had a significant and long debate about the use of neonicotinoid insecticides and their impact on pollinators, and they will be removed for two years from January onwards. A great cost to, to large numbers of companies I've worked with, again, because of concerns about the environment. What makes TB and batches different? 
Why is it that farmers have been given complete free pass on this terrible pollution incident and we're now having to pay to eradicate our protected wildlife as a result? That is just fundamentally wrong. And it turns the polluters pays principle on its head. And that's something that I really wanted to start from here today. Because when I talk about this policy, I talk about it being built on three pillars of sand. Negligence, incompetence, and deceit. Negligence, because we know that farmers have not got on top of biosecurity in this country. We move more cows in Britain than any other country in the European Union. On average, 13 million a year at the present time, and it's going up hundreds of thousands every year as well. So over the last six years, for example, you've moved around 78 million cattle in this country. But how many prosecutions have there been for infringements of TB movement rules? TB fraud. Well, there have been 24 investigations, and there have been 11 prosecutions in that time. Now, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to work out that if one in 100 farmers could break the rules, and we're going to see more TB reactor cattle move when they shouldn't be, we're going to see cattle passports being altered and ear tags being tampered with. We're going to see potentially milk being sold from TB reactor cattle and other issues that we have seen come to the courts. This is a widespread problem that is likely to make the, the, the whole issue of biosecurity and TB spread worse. And that is something that's just not being tackled. And there's no commitment from the farming industry to do it. And then when you look at the farm gate level, there are many people in this room that work very hard to educate farmers and others on what they can do with fences in securing their cattle pens, their feed pens, from badger cattle interaction. We know this can make a difference, but how many farmers are actually doing it? How much incentive from government is there for them to do it? How much incentive is there from retailers for them to do it? Very little indeed. Most don't want to talk about it, most won't invest in it, and I'm afraid there are quite a lot that just lack when you talk about biosecurity, which is a great tragedy in terms of trying to get on top of this disease. And let no one think that it's not having a major impact on farmers, it is. You know, you can't work in the farming industry in the way that I have and met farmers and worked with them at a senior level both in Britain and around the world to understand, and not understand the impact of a disease like this, where you're losing cattle regularly, it's having a significant economic and social impact. We need to find a long-term solution, but we have to be practical and honest about what those solutions are. We also have to learn about the mistakes of the past. One of the big mistakes that I went through was the foot and mouth issue. If you look back at 2001, I had come from the Ministry of Agriculture into the Food and Drink Federation. I was one of the key people that was linking the departments in, in the food side with my former colleagues and officials in, in the department in DEFRA on managing this particular outbreak of foot and mouth that we haven't seen since the late 60s, since 1967. Some big issues that came out of that debate. Firstly, is how would you deal with an animal disease like that? The Prince of Wales, the Soil Association, and many others in the industry, in farming and agriculture, came back to government and said, I think we can vaccinate these cows to stop the transmission of this disease. And that in itself was seen as a practical alternative to culling of the national herd. <coughs> Tony Blair looked at that, the chief veterinary officer at the time, and the chief scientific officer at the time looked at it and agreed that was a practical way forward. They put together a large team of vaccinators, they set up big sheds in Cumbria where we had the major outbreak of foot and mouth, they got approval from the European Commission to actually vaccinate those animals, ring fence vaccinate to stop the transmission of the disease. It was the National Farmers Union that came in at the last minute and said to government, hold on a minute, if you do that, we're going to lose our exports of meat and dairy and livestock to Europe. We can't afford to do that. They also came to see my boss, Peter Blackburn at the Food and Drink Federation, who was the chairman of the Nestle at the time, and told him the same. And the director general of the organization, Sylvia Jay, that had a very good contact with, with Tony Blair, her husband actually headed the Foreign Office at the time, went back. And they both went, Ben Gill and Sylvia Jay, Peter Blackburn, and spoke to the Prime Minister and turned that policy around within 24 hours. So we went from vaccination to slaughter. And you all know what happened after that. We slaughtered millions of animals across the country. We shut down the country effectively for six months. We delayed a general election. We spent over two billion compensating farmers. And we spent another four billion as a result of what actually happened in the rural economy. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, we then had to deal with restocking of cattle. And this way, it's really got messy. Because Ben Gill came back and said to the Chief Veterinary Officer and Chief Scientific Officer and to the Agriculture Minister Nick Brown that we need to restock from areas where there are not foot of mouth problems. And that was primarily the Southwest. But the Southwest was a TB hotspot area. And the Chief Veterinary Officer and Scientific Officer said to them, well, listen, you're going to have a problem with TB here. But Ben Gill's response is we need to get these animals back. We need to get the farming industry back on its feet. It's important for the NFU. It's important for British agriculture. And the Agriculture Minister gave in. Tony Blair gave in. And those cattle moved. 
tens of thousands of those cattle removed. And over the next 18 months, you treble, treble bovine TB in the herds in this country. And you also significantly increase the level of disease within the badger community as a result as well. There is no doubt about that. Now, many people in the NFU and government will try and rewrite history and say that was a short-term impact, it was a mistake. It wasn't short-term, it's long-term. We're still living with the consequences today. It was a terrible decision. It was a decision that was taken knowing what the long-term impact would be, and we're now here faced with killing our wildlife as a result. And that is the sort of mistake that we shouldn't make and we cannot afford to make going forward in the future. And also what we must think about is how honest are we about the whole system of TB control? Up to June of this year, most people in this country didn't understand the fact that TB reactors were being sold into the food chain. That was a story that I was particularly involved in, in putting forward to the Sunday Times, which they put on their front page. The reason I did that, and others who were concerned about the badger car, is because we saw huge hypocrisy from government, who were telling us on one side we have to kill badgers because of public health concerns, but on the other, actually selling large amounts of TB meat into the food supply chain with no labeling or traceability at all, into hospitals, schools, into our armed forces. The level of risk on that area is very small, but it is there, and it's something that needs to be considered. And the Health Protection Agency is now having to go back over data, as the Food Standards Agency is, on the need for pre-treat heat treatment of that meat, for example, to kill off any potential problems that you might have in terms of TB bacteria. But those are issues that the public has a right to know and really throw a cart and horses through the arguments that actually we should be killing badgers because there are public health concerns. Over 10 million pounds a year is being brought back in from that TB meat business and put back in to the cattle compensation system. And it's a vicious circle. On one side, you have farmers who are putting their TB reactors into the food system. On the other side, you have deference and the business is selling them, needing the money to pay back into the compensation costs as well. And the European community has finally begun to cotton on to the problem that we have in this country with TB. When you had the TB inquiry from the FRA Select Committee a few months ago, the European Commission gave evidence. It was really scathing about the number of cattle movements in this country, and it made it clear that the UK government and farmers needed to be doing more on biosecurity. Since January this year, we have better measures in place that the government and farmers were not happy to do, but have been forced to do. They're going to keep the compensation money coming. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the comparisons, between 2013 and 2012, over the last five or six months, we have seen a reduction in bovine TB in the herds in this country of around two and a half to three percent. But the government have hidden those details. If you look at their press releases, you won't see it even in the footnotes. There's no statements from ministers at all. The National Farmers Union only go back to December last year. They don't want to talk about anything from January to May to June, because they know that shows a reduction, it shows biosecurity is working, and it weakens the justification for the cull. And let's just come on to the cull, what we've actually got going on at the moment in our countryside, because this again staggers me when you consider how this policy was developed and implemented. Firstly, when there's ever been a trial, as there was with the randomized badger cull trial, it was government officials that were carrying out the work, under scrutiny as they should be as civil servants, and open to parliamentary scrutiny and wider public scrutiny as well. In this case, the National Farmers Union was given the license to basically carry out this cull. The National Farmers <coughs> Union was given a license pretty much to put in place whatever it thought needs to be done in terms of how you kill these animals, and whatever needs to be done in terms of humaneness monitoring. And we can see the results of that, of what's going on in Gloucestershire and Somerset at the moment. Why would you go forward with free shooting of badgers, even if you wanted an effective killing method? Because most people who shoot animals will tell you this is going to be very difficult. It's going to result in a high number of these animals being wounded. It's going to result in a large number of them moving, and we're beginning to find those on the edges of the zones at the moment, wounded and dead animals, as we know. And that's going to potentially increase the risk of the spread of this disease. So why would we do that? Well, you're only doing it because it's killing on the cheap. They were offered the opportunity to trap and shoot. But the trap and shoot would be much more expensive. But Owen Patterson was offered that opportunity as well. And these officials are going mad at the moment because they're having to play catch up by doing more trap and shooting because the figures on free shooting are absolutely terrible. High level leaks that we have, and they're reliable in DEFRA, to the 12th of September were telling us that you had less than 100 badgers killed in both zones. Now, they might have been brilliant over the last week and suddenly really improved their efficiency, but I doubt it. At the moment, you've probably got about 250 to 300 badgers killed two weeks from the end of this trial. That's 5,000 short of your target. Now, you can blame the testers for getting in the way, even though most of these shooters have had a pretty clear run on what they're trying to do. But the fact of the matter is, it's failing miserably. The costs involved are astronomical. We've had a huge debate 
about vaccination of vouchers, about how costly it is in Wales, how it's not practical. So why are we spending the best part of a million pounds in policing and official time in Whitehall and at local government level trying to police this tower? Why are we doing that with helicopters at £2,000 an hour to fly over wounded badger patrols? For what? For 250 dead badgers? When we could be vaccinating, when we could be getting hundreds of volunteers to support that process, it's absolutely disgraceful. It makes no logic at all. You could see at the moment, if we look at the numbers that each of those badgers killed, it might come in at around £10,000 each. Now, if only Patterson wants to extend this license, and he can do, beyond six weeks, he's going to have to have a very good justification for doing that in terms of expense, in terms of efficiency, in terms of animal welfare. And I don't think he's got any of those issues covered at all. So let's be really clear about what we're facing going forward. And then we have the testing issue. This is the one thing that I really liked on the day that Cole was announced, when Owen Patterson had to speak about TB testing. The media had largely not looked at that issue at all. They considered this as a scientific process. It never was. To be fair to Jim Pace and others who set it up, it was a killing efficiency process. How many badgers could you kill in six weeks? There was never any plans to test these animals for TB. But we all know in this room why they don't want to test them for TB, because we'll get very similar results to what we had with the randomized badger cub. Okay, and that result would be around 16% of badgers with low level stage of TB, where it wasn't impacting their health, where their risk of transmission was low, and around 1 to 1.5% of badgers with late stage TB that was impacting their health, which were excretors and a high disease risk. But when Owen Patterson talks about that figure, he talks about excretors being around 40%. He talks about this as being a plague of dying badgers bursting with disease around the countryside that needs to be eradicated for their own good. Even David Cameron is taking to, to that debate as well. We're doing badgers a favour by shooting them. Well, you're not. And the figures don't back that up, and the science doesn't back that up. And you're not doing TB testing, not because it's difficult, not because of the money, because you don't want to have another debate about the reality of the disease spread in the badger population itself. And then we have to get back to the transmission of disease between badgers and cattle. There is no certainty in that process. I'm not going to stand in front of you today and say there's not transmission. Okay, there is some transmission, I'm certain of that. But I do not believe it's 50%. Crystal Donnelly in the Imperial College work she did was on mathematical modelling. It was not based on peer-reviewed practical science in the field. But that 50% figure is being used up and down the country by Patterson and others in the NFU to justify this cull. And we have to go back over that, and we are. We have to take those arguments apart. Yes, we have a responsibility to accept there is some disease. But let's get back to what I said earlier. Where did that disease come from? It came from farmers as a result of their practices and their pollution. And that's what we need to tackle when we're going forward. So what else do we need to do in terms of dealing with this disease and getting on top of the reality? Well, first of all, I think we have to look at the issue of politics and science. One of the reasons that's really driven me to get involved with this debate is because over the years I've worked very closely with people like John Krebs, who is chairman of the Food Standards Agency, or Sir John Bennington on international food security issues when he was government chief scientist, or Professor Bob Watson, who again was DEFRA chief scientist on climate change. Now, you couldn't work with those individuals and firstly not respect them for their intelligence and their credibility, not just in Britain and around the world. But then when you talk to them, as I have at times, about the badger pull policy, you always got the same response. It just doesn't make any sense. It's a political decision. It's not science-based. I will not give my credibility to it. Now, that's important. Those individuals are brought into government because they're seen as impartial. They're seen as being experts in their field. They're seen as being able to advise politicians so that people in this room have some credibility in terms of looking at what politicians are, are, are taking decisions. And they, they have some belief that those decisions are being taken in a balanced and correct way. Well, I'm afraid that's not happened. What you've seen with this policy is that you've got a politicization of the civil service, a politicization of the government advisory process in government, which I think is extremely dangerous. What we now have is that a government chief scientist, who has been on the record, because I know people in his department have quoted this back to me, saying this policy is a train wreck and he has to put it through because his political masters are telling him. But at the same time, going out around the country, putting out information which is based upon misinformation, propaganda, and deceit in many cases, and misleading the public. That is fundamentally wrong. They're misleading Parliament, they're misleading the public, they're misleading themselves to a large degree about what the long-term outcome of this policy will be. And then we have the National Farmers Union as well. The NFU has an important player in farming and agriculture. Okay? You need a strong voice, and in some ways I have great respect for Peter Kendall because He's a very good ambassador for the farming industry. You know, he can get up and he can speak, and I've chaired many conferences with him and stood alongside him at many events, and I can see that he's a good spokesperson ambassador for the farming industry, not just here, but around the world as well. 
But when it comes to this issue, there is mental block and complete blindness in the leadership of the NFU. And I'm afraid what they've done here is they've pushed this debate year in, year out, <coughs> not really looking for long-term solutions or alternatives. At no stage was the National Farmers Union willing to sit down with wildlife and conservation groups and say, listen, could we find a new way through this process that will help farmers, that will get the confidence of government, that will also protect the reputation of farmers? No, that's never, ever happened. What they've done is pushed on with the policy and had significant influence over a government direction that shouldn't be happening. The NFU has a place around the table, but then the Wildlife Trust and the National Trust and all the organisations like the Badger Trust that we work with and support need to have an equal say as well. Wildlife management, wildlife protection is something that concerns all of us. It's not left in the hands of industry or landowners or farmers or fishermen to decide these issues. We must all have a say. And the relationship the NFU has, I believe, with DEFRA as it stands today, is every much bit as damaging as the relationship it had with MAF in the late 1990s when I left, which was then basically broken up and changed in terms of names and structures after BSC because it was seen that the NFU had too much influence. So we're back 13 years later to where we started. I'm sorry, but some of the briefing documents coming out of DEFRA could have been written by the NFU. The tweets coming out of DEFRA could have been controlled by the NFU. The NFU's office is next to DEFRA. There's probably a door that connects the two. <laughs> Richard Bennion, at times, might as well be a representative of the Countryside Alliance in the way that he speaks about wildlife organisations like the RSPCA and refuses to talk about conservation issues such as the protection of hares from shooting during their breeding season that we're trying to deal with as well. This has gone far too much in the direction of those vested landowning farming interests controlling the agenda. That's not good, in my view, for the future of farming in this country. It's definitely not good for the future of wildlife protection. And the public has a voice. And the fascinating thing about the Badger Call debate is that voice is getting stronger all the time. And I was standing on that hill a few weeks ago in Taunton in the rain with 500 people, or speaking as I have been in vigils and marches in Bedford and Kettering and Northampton and other towns. More and more people are coming out all the time. People from Europe, people from America are getting involved in this campaign. You know, I was with a chap called Arnie Graff, who's a, an organizer, very well-known community organizer and civil rights organizer that worked very closely with Barack Obama in the 1980s in Chicago here recently, uh, last week, talking about community issues and environmental issues. We had a number of people in the room, and he was asking, and been traveling up and down the country, and he said, what's this about the budget? Where have I got people tell me this is a great community-led initiative bringing people together? And I said, yes, it is. Because for the first time, it's breaking down barriers. It's bringing people out who've never protested about things before who suddenly care passionately about an animal that most people have never seen in the wild. If they're fortunate, they might do, but many haven't, but they still care. And why do they care? Because they care about our natural environment, they care about the future of these animals. And they should do. It's not just about badges, it's about buzzards, it's about hares, it's about bees, it's about all the things that we consider valuable. And the one thing I've always had a problem with, with people like Peter Kendall, or people like Owen Patterson, is they do not put a value on these animals. To them, it's a problem to be solved. Why was this animal given protection? Why can't we lift that protection? It's on our land. Why can't a farmer eradicate it as a pest if they need to? Well, that's not the case. Badgers have lived in this country for over 300,000 years. They've seen all our history of civilization and wars and economic social developments and just gone on with their lives. What gives farmers the right in 30 or 40 years of bad practices where they've polluted those animals to suddenly start to eradicate 150 and 200,000 of them? What gives the right to what I consider a pretty second-rate politician like Owen Patterson to, to be honest, have little interest in wildlife or science to take that decision and disappear in a few years' time and those animals are still being killed? What gives the right to someone like Peter Kendall to take a decision like that before he goes off to the House of Lords, which he presumably will at some time, to say, well, I've got my peerage for all that great service to farmers, where those badgers are still being killed as a result. They'll be killed long after these people are off the scene. The decisions that are being taken today are terribly important for all of us and for the future of wildlife. And what we're beginning to see in this country, through the Wildlife Trust, 800,000 plus members, through organisations like the RSPB with 3 million plus members, through National Trust with 4 million plus members who are going to vote on this issue at their Cardiff AGM in a few weeks' time, is something growing in power. Something that's beginning to really wake the politicians up, to think actually wildlife and protection of wildlife is something that people passionately think is important in this country. And often people say to me, why is this the British thing? Are they going to kill them in New Zealand or they'll kill them in France or they do this in Germany? Because Britain is different to many other countries in the world. We have a history of care and compassion for wildlife that goes back hundreds of years. 
That's why the Vegan and Vegetarian Society started here. That's why the RSPCA started here. Compassion and World Wild uh, Farming started here. The World Wildlife Fund started here. That's why in one small town in Horsham, a charity shop was established by Virginia McKenna, Bill Jordan, Bill Travers, back in the early 70s, to sell products to raise money for animal welfare issues, which spawned two charities, Born Free and Care for the Wild, which have done great work in Britain and around the world. That's what makes this country different. That's why the politicians need to wake up to this. And the systems of government that we have are just not good enough. I don't think Natural England, I don't think the Environment Agency, even if it survives, is an effective voice for protecting wildlife in this country. I would like to see a wildlife protection agency established, which is completely separate from DEFRA, that has a steering committee of wildlife conservation organizations on it, that to be quite honest with you, is a pain in the ass every time you want to build a HS2 rail link, or you want to extend Heathrow Airport, or you want to bring out a new system of pesticide control, or you want to eradicate an animal because you say there's a problem in disease in cattle. You have to deal with this agency, independent science and representatives that are strong, that will balance it in government. That's what we need, and that's what we don't have. It cannot be left in the political hands of people like Owen Patterson who have political advisors who work for the Countryside Alliance, that spends most of his time talking to National Farmers Union and developing policy with them, who will refuse and also doesn't even understand the same plan that we're on when we have the sort of debates we're having here today. So we have to address that, we have to do something about it. But also retailers. The food retailers have got off very, very lightly in this badger coal debate. When you consider it, this didn't come out of space, this intensive livestock agriculture system that I've worked in and understand, and others have, who've worked in the food industry. It was created both by us as consumers that want cheap food every day we go into a supermarket, but by those really effective and efficient retail machines that lead the world in this country. They've created a monster, and that monster's destroying our wildlife. Now, those retailers will tell us they've got great schemes in place for procuring sustainable soya from the Amazon, or palm oil from Indonesia that will protect orangutans. All that's terribly important. But what about what's going on with our wildlife here when you're selling milk at a cheap price that's forcing farmers to intensify their cattle herd, to move 13 million around, and then they're destroying it, and you sit there and say, well, it's a difficult decision, but we just let them get on with it. That is not acceptable. All of us as consumers should make that clear. But the retailers have a way forward on this, and they've done things in the past that are difficult. When it came to the debate about insecticides and neonicotinoids, the Carl, for example, started to remove them from their chain before the European Commission took action. Now, I know, because I used to work in that area, how complicated and expensive that is. Because you can imagine that you've got foods coming from all over the world. They took that decision because they knew two things. Firstly, there was growing public concern about it. And secondly, there was more peer-reviewed evidence to indicate there might be a problem that had to be tackled. So they took a decision that influenced the, the wider government policy process. Now, if they do that, why can't they do something on badgers? Why can't the co-op that has significant farms of its own that supplies into its food supply chain not come up with a welfare scheme for farmers, which will pay that farmer more money for his milk, which he wants, and the public would support, in return for him putting in or her biosecurity measures on the farm, fences and gates that will work, it can be practically assessed for their effectiveness, and works with a wildlife group to vaccinate the cattle, uh, the badgers. And then you sell that product in store as both cattle and badger welfare friendly. With a premium price, it would work. You would get hundreds of thousands of people would buy into it. It would be good for the co-op. Others like M&S and Waitrose could take it on. You might not change Tesco overnight, but you'd have an influence. That's the sort of thinking we need to start seeing in the retailers that we've not seen so far. Another issue, too, I want to come on to this whole vaccination issue of capital. Because this is another one that's really been largely hidden from the public debate. Why is it the National Farmers Union has not had a big debate publicly about the value of vaccination? Why has it had no marches of its members going down white or thousands of them saying we demand it now? Why are they not lobbying for this? Well, I'll tell you why they're not lobbying for it. It's because many of them don't want it. Because they're concerned, going back to the discussions we had about foot and mouth in 2001, that if you inject a cow, you can't export a cow. Okay? At the moment, the indication is that would only affect the live export of animals. Actually, it will probably go wider, particularly in countries like China and Russia, which are very valuable markets, with impact on dairy products and meat products as well. And believe me, those markets are important, because there's so little money to be made in cattle and dairy in this country at the present time, that you're looking to China to make the money. So what we're effectively going to do to maintain that export status is eradicate our wildlife so we can sell cheap products to China. That is the long-term strategy that the National Farmers Union and government have signed up to. Believe me, it is. Badger control, as they call it, which is eradication of large numbers across the country, as we all know, 
is part of that process to continue to keep that disease-free status so that you can continue to export without the risk of having to go into very long, tangled, difficult international agreements, which can take years to, to unwind. But you know what? We could lose the China market. We could have a premium sector in the UK to sell product without having to go after it, and we'd look after our wildlife as a consequence. Would that not be good for farmers? Would that not be good for our wildlife and the way that people feel about this country? And the other thing is this. We can trial cattle vaccines in the UK, and we're going to over the next 18 months. And good luck to the Welsh Government who pushed this really hard. But if you're still stuck in that 10-year timetable, it means nothing from the European Commission. What we should be seeking is a derogation, so that farmers can start to vaccinate their cattle, but they will be certified not for export. They will only be for the UK market. So they will have a vaccinated status attached to them. And you know what? If the retailers bought into that and said we would buy vaccinated status cattle and we would give a premium to those products, we'd label it as such as part of a scheme that the farmers have signed up to to eradicate this disease without killing wildlife, I think they'd be on to a winner. I think before long, actually, a lot of those export markets would start to dry up and you'd see more premium market being created for vaccinated cattle that were avoiding killing badgers in this way. So we need some fresh thinking and we're just not seeing it at all, which I think is terribly important. The last few weeks have been difficult seeing how this issue has played out. As I said, I think there's been some very positives as well. And the political pressure is growing. The EDM that Dave mentioned, I think, is nearly over 150 MPs signed up to it. MPs are being bombarded by their constituents. And they're getting information they've not seen in the past. Articles have been written by people like me and others, videos and presentations that are really beginning to open up the debate, which I think is terribly important. That National Trust motion if it can be supported by hundreds of thousands of people, will force the National Trust, in my view, to stop culling on their land. Helen Ghosh, as a former Perm Secretary at DEFRA, was very much responsible for putting together the Labour policy on badger vaccination rather than culling. She's very sympathetic to the views of most of us in this room, and she happens to be Director General of the National Trust. And I hope she can use that position if she sees a lot of people sign that motion to say that actually a significant proportion of our members want action on this. So the more people that can sign that, the better. I also think that we're beginning to maybe make a change in the way that government is starting to work. You know, I was speaking to Mary Craig and others on the opposition side on this. Next week in, in Brighton at the Labour conference, I think we will see a strong commitment from Labour against the cut. Not just sitting on the fence thinking, well, actually, if they start, we might not be able to finish because the scientists will tell us we've got to complete. It's beginning to add up politically now. Even for Ed Miliband, who hasn't taken that much interest today. The Green Party were excellent in coming out very strongly again. Labour come out, as I expect them to do strongly against it next week. The political consensus is moving our way. The Liberal Democrats are now shifting left and right. How are we going to get into government again? <laughs> but it's important. We work on them as well. Liberal Democrats are peeling away from this. And if they have to form a coalition with Labour, they'll dump it. And then we come to the gassing issue. The great gassing issue. There'll be more in Sunday Times about gassing because there's more work going on on that. DEFRA is researching gassing, use of gas foam at the present time. It's not been going public with everything it's done, but it is going on. There are meetings going around the country, as you know, to, uh, for, on TV eradication, farm group meetings that DEFRA is hosting. And each of those meetings, you wouldn't have to be much of a fly on the wall to work it out. Farmers are unhappy, they know the cull is going down the Swanee, and they want gassing as the other option. But gassing is going to be very difficult for a number of reasons. Firstly, publicly it's very difficult. The likes of David Cameron to have a debate about stopping gassing of humans in Syria, which is terrible for all of us, as we know then use chemical weapons that are very similar against our wildlife in the country. You'd have to take that to Port Down and facilities like that and do a proper research study, which is open to public scrutiny, which will take time. And again, won't be pleasant. Imagine MPs that want to go for a day out down to Port Down to see how you're going to gas wildlife, and they won't want to necessarily be seen supporting it. And many farmers are concerned about the impacts as well. So I think actually we can win this debate, because what we will see is that free shooting has failed. What we will see is actually that trap and shoot in cost comparison, we might as well trap and vaccinate. So let's be clear about that. And that's why Owen Patterson never wanted to have trap and vaccinate on a large scale in this scheme. But that's why his officials are so bloody angry with him. Because they said, Owen, we're not certainly going to be able to shoot them like this. We've got no fallback. You've only got 10% trap and shoot. We're going to have to come in with more. And when we come in with more, where are we going to get the labour from? So they're looking around veterinary colleges at the moment to try and recruit more people to put cages in. But that cost is going up all the time. And Owen Patterson never wanted that cost comparison. Well, now he has it. So he's going getting away from it, which I think is important too. So the cull is coming. Public support is moving our way. Political support is moving our way. And I think the scientists are moving our way too. 
even the people like Crystal Donnelly and others over the years have really sort of hedged their bets on the benefits of culling. You know, the statement she made at Cambridge University two weeks ago where she talked about the whole issue of culling in a slightly different perspective, in the sense that if you're really going to effectively get rid of this disease in animals, you'd have to eradicate it completely, and that's not going to happen. In fact, if you did what you needed to do as far as she was concerned in the badger community, you'd have to take the levels down 90, 95% below the bird convention agreements that were signed up to. And she said if you didn't do that, all you're going to do is reinforce the disease in the animals that are left. And then they're just going to repopulate the sets of those that you've killed. And you're just going to make a problem worse. Now, that's important that we recognize that. Because it shows the weakness of this whole policy. The absurdity of this policy in terms of going forward. So, just to finish from my perspective. They said that this policy was built on sort of incompetence, negligence, and deceit. And that it's, it's full of holes. And it's one of the worst environment policies, farm policies I've ever seen. Um, I think we're learning lessons from this exercise. I think we've opened up questions about intensive agriculture and farming that we've not had since the days of BSE in the 90s, for example. I think we're starting a debate about valuing wildlife in a way that we've not had for a generation. I think we're beginning to see issues connected in a way that we've not seen, from different species, from hares to badgers to buzzards to bees, all the animals that we care about, different groups lobbying campaign on, we're all coming together now for a strong voice for valuing those animals and how we take decisions about how we protect them. I think the days of these backroom deals being taken by the NFU and the countryside landowning organizations to get these things done without anyone getting in the way are over. Social media has changed everything. Twitter is an incredibly powerful tool. When Secret World released those images as you did a few days ago with those reports and the excellent work you did, we got some excellent regional media. And congratulations on that. The national media are a bit more hesitant, they have many other issues going on, didn't quite run it the way we wanted to. But on social media, it exploded. That the NFU and everyone couldn't hide away from it. Those images were there for everyone to see. And I was speaking on BBC Radio Somerset yesterday, and talking about the, you know, the whole issue of the humaneness of this car. And I was speaking to a chap called Jamie Foster, some of you might know on Twitter, I think it's a lawyer down in Swanson for Countryside Alliance and other interests. And he was trying to justify the whole process of humaneness, saying that, well, you know, we've got what we need in place to make sure we shoot these animals cleanly, and that's no problem. Well, we can take that argument apart. You know, I joked in Taunton that you're more likely to find a UN's weapons inspector in Damascus than you are finding a monitor for death or in the cold zone. But that's <laughs> true. Four to six people, two at any one time, in places the size of Isle of Wight, no chance. Even if they're working hard, they're not going to be able to monitor this. So we took that argument apart. And then he said, well, I don't believe any of those badges that are being found of being shot in the cold zones. Okay, so who is shooting them then? It's rather farmers are shooting them illegally. Yeah. Well, they're coming out in the cold zones yeah. because they're being wounded and not shot cleanly. And he sort of came back to me on Twitter and said, well, I think it might be wildlife groups doing it. Oh. And I thought, you're a lawyer, so if you're going to go to court with that argument, it's going to be very weak. But it shows to me the desperation of individuals who are opposing this has come up with that sort of statement. It's not wildlife groups doing it. We know that. At the end of the day, What's happening here is a clear example of how this cull is failing and how public opinion is turning against it as well. And I think you know, that's something that we, we need to be very, very sort of focused on going forward. In terms of what you're able to do, just keep campaigning. The Badger Patrol movement is fantastic. And all credit to IFO and others that helped set it up, because I wasn't involved. They were beavering away, people like me were just going around doing television interviews. And they set something up that was very special. I remember when I was outside the High Court the day that the NFU tried their injunction to stop peaceful protests being interviewed for ITN. And their view was, well, what about all these animal rights activists who are going to go around kicking everyone in? And I said, well, listen, what you're going to see here is a peaceful movement that you've not seen in this country maybe for generations. People are going to come out and they're going to march at night around these zones, and they're going to do so in a peaceful, dignified way to show their protest and to see if any animals come out that they can help. And the media couldn't quite get their head around that. Oh God, they've loved it when they've seen it on the ground. They've been down there, they've been recording it and talking about it. It's all over the US media as well and the international media. And it shows a new face of wildlife ambassadors in this country. That people are willing to give up nights and then go to work the next day to do something, to be seen to want to do something. And people like Owen Patterson and Peter Kendall are terrified of that. They can deal with the so-called extremists. That gives them the bogey men and the bogey women that they can go after. But peaceful protesters in the Rotary Club and the Women's Institute and parish councillors? And then you have the absurdity of helicopters hovering over these people taking pictures. 
and the police are mobilizing around the counties to try and monitor what they're doing. It's absurd, and we know it's absurd. It's dignified, peaceful protests. It's the Badger Trust. It's wildlife groups. It's various individuals at the local level doing what we do best in this country, and it's making a difference. And that's why we're right. That's why we'll win this battle. That's why what you're doing here today, what we're all doing, is going to be very, very important for the long-term protection of wildlife for generations to come. So keep it up. It's really good to see you here today. Thank you very much.